Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Simply Nerdy. Uh, this is Anthony hosting tonight, and I'm joined by the usual gang. Hello. 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 For this episode, we wanted to kind of cover a special topic that we wanted to, first of all, kind of give some some background for why we're even covering this. <laughs> so what we wanted to, first of all, what we wanted to discuss was a book written by our favorite author, or at least my favorite author. <laughs> our favorite author. Our favorite, okay, very good. A book called Tress of the Emerald Sea. And we just kind of wanted to talk about what we thought about it. Now, as for our reasons why we're discussing that here when we usually discuss video games, I point you to the name of our channel, Simply Nerdy. <laughs> we are Simply Nerdy and we talk about nerdy things. And you know, that was actually our original intent all along. It's a lot easier to talk about video games most of the time, but this is something mm -hmm. we're passionate about too. So we wanted to kind of talk about it. <laughs> we're branching out. Amen. Yes. So be warned, this is very much a spoiler cast. If you have not read the book and you don't want it spoiled, then probably should not listen to this episode and come back once you've read it. But otherwise, yes. stay tuned. So, Yeah, no, I wouldn't say don't listen to the episode. Read the book yeah, first yes. and then listen to the episode. <laughs> <laughs> read the book so that you're spoiler immune and then, and then listen to our thoughts if you want. <laughs> So we've got several topics we want to discuss about what we liked. And I think one of the first things we wanted to use as kind of a, a backdrop for our discussion is something that Sanderson himself stated about the inspiration for the book. So in, I believe, the end notes, he talks about how his inspiration was the story of the Princess Bride, but with the twist of what if the princess, instead of waiting around for rescue, went out to do the rescuing or something like that. And it kind of gives it a bit of an interesting color. You know, I don't know if that's off-putting for some, but you know, that's the similarities to Princess Bride are mostly on kind of a twist on that story's plot, but you know, it's otherwise very much its own book, but. Yeah, it's like a, it's a conceptual twist. I don't know, like you, it's clearly, you can see the inspirations, but it is not. Exactly the same. <laughs> that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, no, it's not even, it doesn't end even, even end up being that similar. It's more like, oh, I can see the inspirations, I could, including the tone of the book. The tone feels a little bit more whimsical fairy tale in nature than most of Sanderson's Cosmer books, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, I guess I didn't feel like there was so many overt references that I realized, oh wait, this is totally Princess Bride, but but it's interesting to kind of think about it from that perspective because you can kind of see the, some of the similarities. But yeah, once you said that, you were like, oh. <laughs> yeah, at first I was a little surprised. I was like, wait, what? And then I was like, oh, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> So with that backdrop in mind, I think what we want to start talking about is kind of the ways that he differentiates this story, because this is Sanderson we're talking about, and you know he doesn't do things by halves when it comes to world building, characterization, I, I feel like anyway. And oh, absolutely. So that's, that's where I want to start, is probably what my favorite thing about this book was, uh, the subject of world building. As we were saying, yes, it's you know it's inspired by Princess Bride, but the the world it takes place in it couldn't be more different. So it's called Tress of the Emerald Sea because this main character Tress lives on a world where instead of having liquid water oceans, the oceans quote unquote are instead made up of spores, spores of varying characteristics and colors, you know, indicated by, you know, emerald sea. And these these spores, the way that, that they can sail these, because normally they'd be, you know, solid. You'd walk on it, you couldn't sail in it. But in this world, there is an effect they call the sieve, where uh, basically if I remember correctly, air, air currents kind of bubble up through the spores and kind of liquidize them. And that's actually based on real science. You can do that to sand and it will kind of liquidize until it, it, you know, it's not happening until you stop subjecting it to that. But it's just a very, very unique and interesting take on, you know, the usual high seas kind of adventure. It's, it's, it's not just high seas, it's you're sailing 
an ocean made of, of magical spores that, and here's the twist, they are activated by water. So if you if you swallow them, then they basically kill you. So in the emerald, <laughs> basically <laughs> in the emerald sea, if you put water on the spores, they explode into growths of vines. And so you know if that happens inside your body, you kind of explode. Um, so you know it's just, <laughs> so it's very just uncomfortably very very. I mean, like, it's very characteristic of Sanderson to take, you know, all of these ideas and make them just so unique. Like, I don't, I can't think of any other author that's made a world quite like that one. Find real science and then put a a, a fantasy twist to it is kind of what he, how he puts it. But he does it so well. And you can actually, if you haven't already seen it, he did a video with Mark, uh, I forget his last name. Mark Rober. Mark Rober. Thank you. Uh, he did a video with with Mark, and uh, he they they show you exactly what he's talking about, and it's so clear, and it oh, it's so good. I had no idea they made a video. I should go watch that. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really cool. good. It's a cool way to visualize the, the entire concept of of this sea made out of out of spores. Yeah. So I have a question for you guys. How, how did you picture these spores? Like, how big do you did you picture them being? <clears throat> Huge vines, to be honest. <laughs> no, no, like as spores, not as vines. I know it wasn't vines, but... I kind of imagined them like salt, like table salt sized. Uh, you know, not not yeah. like that uniform, but near that size and maybe about like up to the size of a bead, maybe? Between it the size sound- of table salt and the bead. Sorry. It does sound like they're easily kicked up into the air and thrown about by the wind, so... Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was seeing people discussing this, and I thought it was just an interesting thing, like, how you visualize the story. Like, I'm kind of with Lisa. I pictured something similar to sand, you know? Possibly, possibly because I'd seen videos of fluidization using sand, so... It's kind of what I imagined, but something a little lighter that can be like kicked up into the air or like by a breeze or something but yeah it's just also correct me if i'm wrong but didn't the spores change depending on what moon it was under because yeah. in, in trust of the emerald sea there's 12 moons are there 12 yeah uh, I, don't, yes. I don't remember Some the amount. specific number but but yeah so that's another interesting twist so this world that they live on it's surrounded by a bunch of, of moons that are in incredibly close orbit based on what we hear. There's there's a whole bunch of them, and they are the source of the spores. And so the spores basically kind of rain down onto this planet and fill the, the, the seas, so to speak. And there's many different seas based on which moon is supplying the spores to that that region. So there's the Mm. Emerald Sea, you know, from from the name of the book. There's like the Crimson Sea, the Midnight Sea, you know, stuff like that. And they all... And others that we haven't even heard of yet. Right. And and, uh, they all have different spores that that have different reactions to, to water. To water, yes. I feel like the spores are very fun as a concept, mostly because I'm not necessarily, uh, as a landlubber myself, I'm not particularly comfortable with the ocean in its current form, you know, good old, good old water or ocean, but uh, a sea that is dangerous even when it is, you know, just like imagine being scared of a cup of water on your desk, like that's... It's kind of a it's kind of a fun twist there, and so yeah, I th- I found it fun. And also, I will say something I think supports my view of the size of the spores is that they are easily inhaled, and easily gotten in your eye without you really mm. noticing. Mm. You know? Wow, these are tiny. So um, I think if they were gigantic, <laughs> you would you'd know if it was in your eye. You'd be a little more aware. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah, yeah they're. Definitely- they're definitely small. They're they're smaller, right? But somebody was somebody was pointing out how like when you on Earth, spores are like microscopic. So oh yeah, oh yeah, that's a good point. So moving on, then you know uh, we've established this world has some pretty fantastic world building. So then moving on to kind of the characterization, and I think I want to kind of start by focusing on Tress in particular. For me, I remember starting the book and kind of thinking that you know. 
I don't know. She didn't feel like a normal Sanderson character. She just kind of felt uh, a little milk toast at first to me. And uh, and maybe that was by design. I, I don't know. It's It was just interesting how she started off, but then like really kind of grew into her own as she went on this this adventure. Now, the adventure being, uh, you know, or she has this love of hers. So, you know, here's where some of the similarities to Princess Bride really starts coming out. And uh, he basically ends up being taken away to, to be married off and then disappears. And she learns that uh, he has been given uh, as a prisoner or something uh, to uh, the sorceress who lives in the, the Midnight Sea. To, to the big bad, basically. <laughs> yeah, the big bad. So she decides to go on this adventure, even though she's just kind of a just a country girl who washes windows. She goes on this adventure to save this man that she loves. The way that she develops, it, it, she becomes basically an entirely different person from where she started off. And I think the things the thing that I loved about that so much is that it kind of felt like. I don't know, like a, a commentary on on the ways that we as people in general can grow. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I can agree where you're coming from, but I actually experienced it differently in that I really loved the way that she wasn't characterized as anything extraordinary. Agreed. Because I, I feel like, like in, in books and in stories a lot. Thanks, Steve. Sorry. No, I really do. Uh, in in books and in stories a lot, we go for the sensational because that's that's what's tends to be interesting to read about and it gets almost trite and so i really liked that she was just like she she appeared as some random bland girl um and she saw herself that way too mm -hmm. she um, says it multiple but times. i feel like th yeah i think as the book went along it actually showed how that she she was extraordinary the whole time and it was that it was her own views about herself and her relationships with others that that were incorrect because you know just like from the start she has this huge task that she has to undertake and she somehow manages it just because of all the people who love her and care about her that she has managed to you know i don't know they no, her they all they all trust her and care about her enough to to try and do this really hard thing and that's kind of like that happens at the end as well. Like it happens throughout the entire book that she's like, she just sees herself as this random, boring, bland girl that doesn't, that isn't up to much, but she like through her, her through her care for others and, and her actually extraordinary traits, she, she brings together all the people in the book to accomplish great things. And, and I just think it's really fun. Yeah, um, no, I loved it. I think that's what she, <laughs> sorry. No, I was going to say, you, you put, I think you put much better what I was basically trying to, to describe hey. is uh, a character who, who views themselves as unremarkable, but goes on to do remarkable things just by virtue of facing her fears and proceeding regardless. Like there's yeah, something her, really powerful in that. Her, her, her character that. development was absolutely brilliant. And I agree with everything that Lisa and Anthony have already said about it. So I won't add anything else. So I'll just say I loved her character development and I loved seeing her transform by the end of the book. It was absolutely brilliant. I, what I want to say though is that the growth is like, the character growth is really great, but the seeds of who she could become were there all along. Like yeah, I loved that too. Like he does a good job of showing how like she has, she's had these traits from the beginning and these traits are the reason she is able to succeed in, in spectacular ways. And, and she uh, didn't know that she had it know, in her. That, it, but she did. Yeah. And that goes with how her relationships with others and with her, like, determination and, and her, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, inquisitive mind, I guess. Like, wanting to just understand how things work. It also benefits her greatly. Anyway, it's a great character. And I, I think it is by design that, like, she comes off as very unremarkable at first. I, w I wouldn't say she's boring. I, she never seemed boring to me, but compared to what you usually get in, fan in fantasy stories, yeah, like Lisa said, like she seems pretty normal compared to most fantasy characters. So, but that makes her journey a lot more interesting in the end. And I think 
going along with that, what made it powerful for me is just realizing that, or at least I felt like one of the messages I was getting from it is, this is true of everyone. You know, everyone has the capability when they exercise confidence and, and try to, you know, give themselves the benefit of the doubt and, you know, not doubting all their own abilities that they can, that everyone can go on to do some pretty mm-hmm. amazing things. So I, that's, that was one of the things I really liked about it. I have one last point. You know, there's that saying or whatever that goes that like courage is being scared, but, but managing to do it anyway, kind of type of thing. Yeah. And I liked, I liked that about like the spores and her is that, you know, she was like, people kept being like, oh, she's not scared of them, but she was, but she managed to do these things that other people hadn't even thought of because she she had the drive she needed she she knew that she needed to do it and she did anyway i just liked that yeah yeah i think the way the way that i would summarize kind of a lot of the thoughts we talked about and i want to use this as kind of a segue into um some of the 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 messages i felt like you know that we've covered to some degree in the in the book but uh, i felt like tress was kind of as a model for the growth that comes from being proactive in the face of the unknown, in the face of, you know, you don't know what to expect from the future and that's scary, but, you know, proceeding anyway, it it just, it was inspiring to me. And kind of going along with that, one of the things I felt like was a a beautiful concluding message was, so, you know, Sanderson himself said that this story was kind of an exploration of what if Basically, Princess Buttercup went on her own adventure to solve her problems instead of waiting for her problems to be solved kind of thing. One thing I really liked at the end, though, was uh, his acknowledgement that even even those like Tress, who have found their strength by overcoming, you know, difficult hardships, I mean, like, what's more scary than basically sand that can be blown in your face and explode your your, your face No off, kidding, yeah. Kind of thing. Like, that's... You know, that, it's kind of... Uh, maximally scary but you know she she goes and overcomes these hardships but in the end one of the messages we get is uh, sometimes they still have to rely on help from their friends and and you know that's how basically the book ends she's she's uh, saved you know in in her efforts to get you know her loved one back from the sorceress by the help of the friends that she made along the way who i guess we haven't had uh, spent much time talking about this and can't really but you know she basically befriends uh, a bunch of pirates and becomes uh, so well loved by them by the you know by the the ways that she helps them that that they help her in return and yeah, i thought that that was a cool agreed. message too that yes we can find our own strength by having confidence in, in in you know and just trying to do our best but you know we also still need help from others and that's just something that's true yep. for all of us i love that yeah and it was basically in the face of certain death you know mm-hmm. yeah i mean you know, the the Midnight Sea is the most dangerous. The sorceress is basically the most dangerous person on the planet, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, she goes after the, the people she cares about regardless and, and tries to help them. And that's kind of cool. Oh, and I, and I do have to say, along with that, I felt like another message that I really liked is that love inspo- inspires loyalty far better and far stronger than mm, fear. That's such a good message. Um, True. And that's, that's very clear from some of the pop, plot points, right? The captain of these pirates is all about the fear, and that's how she controls her crew, yep. right? And, Tra- and Tress is stuck on this ship now, and she's just cares about people and befriending them, even people who aren't even that nice to her. She just cares about people's well-being, right? Eventually, and, uh, every pirate's like and, point of view like shifts as well, where they're like, oh, this is, yeah. she leads a lot better yeah, because of love, right? Instead of fear. And they all just turn on, turn on the captain because of it. So like, I mean, we obviously all love Tress and what the story, what her character arc is, but there's obviously other characters that are worth mentioning. Uh, her love interest, Charlie, for example. I, th- I think I saw people saying that he's supposed to be have like ADHD, which I think is oh. interesting, which is which is kind of like why he like kind of drones on and on telling stories. That totally just, makes I, sense. I know that's something sad or something. <laughs> Sanderson likes to represent people, you know, various types of people in his stories, you know, such as Kaladin, 
having having depression and things like that. So I think in this case, I read that like Charlie's supposed to be someone with like ADHD, and it, it, that kind of makes him unique in some ways, and and that's something that Tress likes about him. So <laughs> you know, she yeah. finds his stories comforting. In the vein of talking about spoilers, did any of you guess the reveal about Charlie? I did at the very end. At the very end, I, <laughs> way too late. I didn't guess that. I didn't guess that uh, that he was the the talking rat. But I knew that there was something yes. sus about that talking rat was yeah, sus so the whole time. You know what? What's fun is that like you the reveal comes and you could see that the the breadcrumbs were there oh, all yeah. along, right? Oh yeah, like, yeah. Like for example, there's there's scenes where Charlie when he's when he's the talking rat. Like he, he starts like droning on with his stories, right? And Tress is just like trying to research spores and is comforted by his stories. Ah, like I missed that one. Huh. Well, they, they worded as like he's he was just talking about his rat life and you know and just kind of droning <laughs> on about details about that. And she found she found the stories comforting. And, and what's funny is that uh, so my wife uh, listened to the story after me and she she predicted remarkably early that. <laughs> That Chuck the rat or Huck the rat was uh, was Charlie, right. and I she's like I have to talk to you now before I finish, <laughs> so you know I was right. <laughs> <laughs> trying not to react, trying not to spoil anything because I knew she was right. And, <laughs> but I had to I had to excuse myself for not catching it because it, just as someone who's read a lot of Sanderson books and and this this book, even though it's pretty different. Uh, style from most of the Cosmere books, it is it is in the Cosmere. And Sanderson has never written a story with people getting transformed in, into animals before. So that's my excuse for not guessing it, because I just I didn't know there was a magic that could do that. Exactly. I was waiting for a magical explanation for this talking rat. And then uh, well I guess there was one kind of but <laughs> apparently, apparently exactly. it's we just haven't seen the application. Exactly. <laughs> so Hoyd, yeah. So it was it was a, definitely a, a goofy representation. I absolutely and, loved uh, Hoyd know. in this book, and I loved how he narrated the entire thing. That was probably one of my favorite things about this book. This is Hoyd. Hoyd is the man. Yeah. The funny thing is, is <laughs> his his narrations, even as kind of uh, in the goofy state he was, it was it still felt on character to me. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. It was, it was it was a lot of fun to like have a, an entire story told from his perspective, but he was also a character. It's just kind of yeah, it was unique. so unique. Yeah, so unique and fun. <laughs> the times when he's like, and then I looked over and said something about eating socks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's so much fun. I, so I listened to the audiobook version, but I later looked at the book and saw some of the illustrations, and including like the final scene where he. He shows up and helps, and, and he's like dressed in some super goofy outfit in the illustration. Uh, the, yeah, it was it was pretty fantastic. You know, I, I, and I loved the part too when he's like, "I lost my sense of taste and my other five senses and uh, <laughs> my other four senses," and and, uh, and then he's like, "No, not that one. The important ones." <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, I love him so much, and I love yeah. the beginning of the book where he's talking about you know how the. I forgot the, the, the guy's name, but the guy who named the island and then immediately left, he was like, he was the smart one. Yeah. And then when he's also like, there was one tree on the island, but it did the sensible thing years ago and died. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I love him. It's so good. It was really fun. The, the fun it, thing about having Hoyt as the narrator of the story, like Sanderson said, has said that this book was actually pretty challenging for him to write because he was, he had to like tell a story from from a unique point of view, right? And a unique, a unique uh, narrative style. And uh, kind of be a little bit more elaborate with his prose, right? I think that he totally succeeded with that. Like some people's big complaint with Sanderson is that they think his prose isn't elab you know, fancy enough. So uh, that's intentional. Sanderson usually tries to write with transparent prose where he, he doesn't want it to get in the way of the story. But look how he's proved how versatile he can be. Uh, mm -hmm. He Absolutely, can write, he can write a more elaborate prose and just totally succeed at it. And uh, it's fun that we get to through Hoyd's voice, his character. And yeah. when he said that the Cosmere gloves were coming off, 
they came off. Man, like holy Cosmere Palooza. <laughs> it was insane and I loved it. It was so awesome. That moment when, so when he's making the comparison where he's saying that, you know, Huck, the rat's uh, way of dealing with Tress trying to get to the sorceress by trying to sabotage her and, and telling her that basically, well, it's because I'm doing this for your own good. I can't, you know, basically I can't trust you, trust you with this yourself kind of thing. And then he just throws in that little tidbit, that Cosmere shattering tidbit, I thought, where he's like, I said that once. I said it with 16 other people. And I'm like, what? The shattering? Ooh. What is this calling us? Because <laughs> I've for the longest time I've wondered what was their motivation? And now it sounds like he's kind of revealed just a little bit of that. that I was going to say, didn't it? Wasn't it in this book that he said he was sent to kill God or something? Was that this book or was that the, the no, last book? It was book? this one. He, he mentioned it was, I don't I remember the exact context, but he mentioned something like that. And it's, and they're obviously referring to, to ad nauseum. Uh, so, shattering. There's enough. Yeah. Like, yeah. He's saying they were saying that they couldn't trust him. They were doing it for his own good or her so they thought or something. I don't know. Yeah. So Maybe they regret it. I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah. There's, we get little tidbits that like make me super excited for when Sanderson eventually gets to Hoyt's backstory, right? That's, oh my gosh. That's yes. we're, we're going to find out. Didn't something. he say this is his last book, though? I guess it'll be a long time. <laughs> Well, now I'm now it's starting to sound like he's bumping up the timetable on that one. Oh, but good. Uh, at any rate, there's a lot of really good stuff to unpack in this book, and we we can't cover it all with the time that we have. But we highly recommend reading it. I was gonna say if yeah. if you haven't read Brandon Sanderson before, this may be a good one to start with, though you won't catch on to all the Cosmere references at first. But uh, you know, you've already read it because you're re you're watching yeah. our podcast anyway. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so you yeah. can suggest it to your friends but they won't catch on to the Cosme references uh, until later but it's still like my wife has started reading it for the this is her first Brandon Sanderson book and she's enjoying it so far it's it's a good standalone like you'll miss Cosme references but they're not necessary to understand the story so I actually mm -hmm. think it's a pretty good place for beginners to be honest yeah, it's it's a really good introduction into his style. You know, the the very unique world building and magic systems he always likes to create, and you know, it's just full of his uh, enjoyable little character twists and and you know, just fun moments like that. So highly worth your time. And you know, it's just even more exciting for the bus, those of us who have been watching the Cosmere for a while because you know, it, it, he's kind of like got this this whole MCU kind of thing going on. And he's finally starting to connect it, and we're just all kind of geeking out. <laughs> yep. Oh, it's so good. It was a solid book. I really enjoyed it. I highly recommend it, and I think you should all give it a chance. Yeah. Because Simply Nerdy gives it a 10 out of 10. We don't give out 10s, I guess, all the time, but I guess we are. Right now. <laughs> Lately, we're giving out 10s for various things, but that's just because we have a lot of a wealth of quality stuff. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we do. Absolutely. No, this book was phenomenal. Yeah, really enjoyed it. So, thank you for listening. Um, if you haven't given the book a, a, a check out, then you know I would say go go give it a look. It's really fun. And uh, for those of you who have read it, let us know what you thought in the comments. Also, just th throwing this out there as well, just for two seconds. The illustrations are beautiful. Yeah, inside he's the book, got a good art team. So, man, like, yeah, en enjoy. Good job, good job, art team. Incredible yeah. job. Anyway, until next time, keep, keep it, it nerdy. nerdy.